I've just seen Jesus. And they said, no, you didn't. He's graveyard dead. They wouldn't believe. Now, here's the problem with prophecy. No one has a right to doubt something that God told you to tell them. Some other disciples saw him. The scripture says in Mark chapter, Mark 16, it says, two other disciples saw him, but he appeared to them in a different form. These were the disciples who were walking along the Emmaus Road. They just heard the report that somebody had seen Jesus and the report came back, well, the grave is empty. So they're walking along the Emmaus Road and they're talking to one another. And they were saying, you know, it's a shame it turned out like this. And while they were talking, Jesus comes along and he walks right up beside them and he says, what are you men talking about? And they looked at Jesus and they said, what are we talking about? Are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know about the things that have taken place here this weekend? And Jesus says, what things? And they begin talking to Jesus about Jesus. And they started telling him, we had hoped that he would be the one who would, who would restore Israel, who would give us our kingdom back. We were hoping that, and, and they went on and on and on. And finally, it was like Jesus just couldn't take any more. And he needed to comfort them. And so he put his arm around the shoulder of one. That's how I see it. He put his arm around, it's not in your Bible, but it's in mine. He put his arm around the shoulder of one of these guys. And he said, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer, to be put to death, and to rise? And the scripture says, and beginning at Moses and the prophets, he started walking them through the scripture. On the way to Emmaus, he's walking them through the scripture here in Genesis. This is him, this is him, this is him. In Exodus, this is him, this is him, this is him. In, in Leviticus, this is him, this is him. And he's looking at all these verses. Some of them are so obscure to them, but when Jesus talks about it and says, that's him, that's the Messiah, that's the Messiah, when they, they are so filled with it, by the time he gets to Malachi, they're at home. And the scripture says they got ready to turn into their house and Jesus acted as if he was going to go a different direction. And they said, oh, no, 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 sir, no, sir. You got to come in with us. And so Jesus was constrained. And he walks into the house with them and they're sitting down and they hand him the loaf of bread and say, will you bless it? And so Jesus takes the bread and he blesses the bread and he breaks the bread and something happened in that moment. The Bible says, and their eyes were open." I want to tell you something. You need to find a moment in your life when God can do something and it is so real to you and so familiar to you that nobody has to tell you Jesus is here. Some people don't know it until they hear somebody say, the presence of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. But some people can say, He's gone. And they looked at one another and said, all the while he was talking to us, oh man, I should have known. I should have known who that was. And he says, he says, did not our hearts burn within us while he was talking to us? Have you ever had a moment in God's presence? Have you ever had a moment when Bishop was talking and your heart started burning within you and then you went somewhere else and you heard somebody else talk and the same burn you felt when he was preaching, you felt again? In that moment, that's the time to say, he's here. I, I don't know where he is, but he's here. I know he's here. I have a friend who has, uh, he has hunting dogs. His, his dog is a, a, a short-haired German pointer. And when these dogs go out on the field to hunt, dogs are all over the place. They're looking for the prey. They're looking for the pheasant. They're looking for the bird. And they're doing like this. They're all over the place, all over the place. And, and these dogs, and as soon as one of them finds, you can even have six, seven, eight, nine dogs out on the field. And as soon as one of the dogs senses the prey, he stops still. He pokes his head out. And he sticks his tail out. And he raises a leg up. And everything in him says, that's the position I'm supposed to take when I smell something and it's right over there. And if you release me, I'll go after it and you can shoot it. And the dog is so intense, he's 
quivering. Do something. And all the other dogs are on the field and they're all doing like this. But one of them looks over in that direction and sees that dog on point. And when he sees that dog on point, he doesn't even know what he's pointing at. He just, he does the same thing. And all the dogs start doing the same thing. And my friend says, it's called honoring the point. Let me tell you something, church. Once in a while, God will come to church. And you may not know he's here, but when somebody over in that corner starts to say, hey! You say, well, what do I do? Honor the point. I don't know what's moving you. I don't know why it's moving you, but I'm going to say yes, just like you're saying yes. If they're dancing, don't let them dance by themselves. Get in on it. Somebody say, honor the point. Did. Did not our hearts burn? I don't know if you ever had a moment. I was at a concert and Phil Driscoll, I'd never heard Phil Driscoll play before and I was watching. I was, I was just intrigued with all of the instrumental stuff that was going on. The guy who was handling the monitors and the sound system and, and the guy on the stage and Phil would pick up a horn and he put it down and he would do something else. And I'm thinking, this is interesting, this is interesting. And I'm sitting there and, and I'm thinking, well, this is a pretty good concert. I'm getting ready to go home. And then all of a sudden, Phil started singing this song. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. You've heard Phil sing. It's a lot better than Bob Dylan, but, you know, Bob would say, Jesus, I love you. You know so, but, but Bob was, Bob would say that, but, but, but Phil was, Jesus, I love you, Jesus, I love you, Jesus, I love you, yes, I do. And he sang it two more times, and all of a sudden, I started to cry. I gave up on what they were doing on the stage, and way up in the balcony, away from the epicenter of all the other stuff that was going on on stage, I'm feeling my heart strangely warmed. And I realize, okay, he's not just a horn player. He's not just a musician. He's a psalmist. And there's something that happens when psalmists pick up a guitar or put their hands on the keyboard. It, it's like it, when Elisha didn't feel like prophesying, he said, bring me a psalmist. And when the psalmist started to play, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. There is something that I'm hungry for in the church. I'm hungry for moments when God will say something, whether through the preaching, even, even in the offering. I was stirred by the offering. I just said, man, I got five messages out of the offering. He'll never know where they came from and they will never know. But I'm amazed at how God can speak to you if you're in tune with what he's doing and you're, you're being stirred by it. And I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I didn't know God was here, but somewhere in your journey, you need to have a catalog of memories where you've had an encounter with God and that encounter became so part of your DNA that whenever you came to a place and you had another encounter with God, that was you. And it was your turn to say, God's here. God's here. My wife will have a moment like that. I'll be sitting in a meeting and I'm taking notes and I'm trying to get all the stuff that's going on. And she's sitting there and all of a sudden I'll look over at her and she stopped reading her Bible. It's closed and she's doing like this. And she's crying. And I'm saying to myself, okay, she's gone somewhere without me. And I don't want her to go there without me. And so I close my computer, slide it under my chair, I shut my Bible, and I look to see which way she's pointing. Because sometimes she does like this. It doesn't make any difference to me. If she's doing like this, I'll do like this or I'll do like this. And if she's crying, I'll start to cry right along with her. I don't need to get a whipping to cry. I learned that I could cry if you told me I was gonna get a whipping. 
It's a spontaneous thing. It's a decision of the will. And I just, I would sit there, and wherever she was, I was right in behind her because something was moving in her. Something was touching her life. Somebody say with me, something's moving. Something's changing. See his glory. Feels like heaven on earth. Something's moving in this house tonight. And God wants to change the atmosphere of your world. He wants to change the atmosphere of your circumstance. Say, something's moving. Something's changing. See his glory. Feels like heaven on earth. Something's moving. Something's changing. See his glory. Feels like heaven on earth. See, I was at a meeting and and I came to the meeting because I wanted to see what was going on because people were saying they were having a revival. And I wasn't sure it was a revival, but I, I went. And 